Hey guys, today we're going to be talking about mineralogy. And this is going to be the first video of a mineralogy playlist that I'm starting. And in this video, I'm going to be giving an introduction over crystal habit, color, luster, streak, cleavage, hardness, specific gravity, magnetism, and more in terms of how to identify different minerals using these characteristics. So let's get started. So the first characteristic we'll talk about is crystal habit. There are a few different types of crystal habits that I want to talk about, and these include prismatic crystal habits habits, which is shown in minerals such as quartz. Then we have columnar crystal habits, and this is an example of columnar crystal habit shown in aragonite. Then we have acicular or needle-like crystal habits shown here by naturalite. Then we have bladed crystal habits where you have like a thin blade-like habit of a crystal, and in this case, this is an example of kyanite. Then we have foliated crystal habits shown here in muscovite. Basically, these are like sheet or plate-like structures, and in terms of muscovite, I think they kind of look like stacks of paper. And then we have dendritic crystal habits. And this is a typical pattern seen in manganese oxides. And it's called dendritic because it's tree-like. Then we have capillary or hair-like crystal habits. As an example here, we have millerite. Within this geode, you can see the darker grayish mineral in there. And that has this hair-like crystal habit. Then we have fibrous crystal habits. An example of this can be seen in serpentine. Then we have course have structuralist minerals in which we call those massive. An example of this can be seen in certain types of quartz. Next we have mineral states of aggregation. Most minerals, unless unusually well crystallized, turn out as aggregates of smaller grains rather than large grains like we just saw in the previous slide with specific crystal habits. And if that's the case, we can use their states of aggregation to help us identify the mineral. And there's terminology that we can use to define different states of mineral aggregation. The first of which is granular, in which specimens consist of mineral grains of approximately equal size. In this case, we have the example of olivine. Next, we have compact, which defines a specimen so fine grain that the state of aggregation is not obvious. Examples of this is seen in clay minerals, such as shown here. Additionally, we have banded states of aggregation, such as shown in this agate here, where banding occurs due to slightly different composition. Then we have botroidal or mammillary states of aggregation aggregation in which botroidal comes from the Greek meaning for cluster of grapes and that's kind of how these minerals look like they look kind of like grapes and then mammillary actually translates to the Latin word for breasts and the only difference between the two is that botroidal is on a smaller scale than mammillary. Then we have reniform in which the surface of the mineral aggregate resembles that of a kidney and the example shown here is hematite. Then we have stalactitic in this state of aggregation aggregation is where the mineral resembles stalactites. And in this case, we have the example of limonite. Then we have geodes. Geode state of aggregation is pretty simple. It's when the mineral is within a geode. In this case, we have quartz. Quartz is typically found inside geodes. And specifically, the purple variety of quartz called amethyst is very common inside geodes. And then next, we have oolitic and pisolytic states of mineral aggregation. And Oolitic and pisolytic are similar to one another, but oolitic is on a smaller scale than pisolytic. Typically, like in the case of the examples we have here, oolitic and pisolytic refer to carbonate minerals because oolids and pisoids are grains that can be coated in carbonate material and compacted and cemented into carbonate rocks in carbonate shelf environments. However, pisolytic mineral aggregation can also be used to describe minerals such as bauxite, shown here at the bottom right. Next, we have mineral color. Mineral color isn't the best way to identify minerals in hand specimen because like we already mentioned there are varieties of minerals that are differently colored for example quartz we mentioned amethyst is the purple variety and we showed a picture earlier of rose quartz which is the pink variety and we also showed a prismatic crystal of translucent quartz and there's also varieties of quartz that are whitish colored and that's milky quartz and then smoky colored and that's smoky quartz and like quartz a lot of other minerals have different varieties that have different colors. However, there are certain minerals and certain varieties of minerals that can be distinguished very easily using color. For example, we have turquoise, which is turquoise in color. That one's easy. Then we have rhodochrosite, which is always pinkish, reddish in color. Then we have sulfur, which is always yellow in color. Then we have malachite, which is always green in color, and azurite, which is always blue in color. And then we have lazurite, which is blue in color. However, like I mentioned, there 
there are other better ways to identify minerals, which we'll go over more in the following slides. But before we do so, I want to talk about the reason why minerals come off as a certain color. And to talk about this, we need to talk about how light or electromagnetic radiation interacts with the mineral. Basically, when light hits a mineral, it can be either absorbed, passed through, or transmitted, or reflected off the mineral. Depending on the mineral, some wavelengths may be absorbed and some may be transmitted or reflected. And the color of the mineral is basically showing the wavelengths that are not absorbed by the mineral. Anything that's reflected or transmitted gets transported to your eyes, which is what you see coming off the mineral, and that's what you perceive as the color of the mineral. However, anything that's absorbed is absorbed by the mineral and will not actually show and meet your eyes and look like anything to you, so it doesn't matter. And as we can see by the electromagnetic spectrum to the bottom right, we know that the wavelengths of light are what determine what color you're going to see when it's reflected or transmitted and hits your eyes. And in this case, we can see that wavelengths around 700 nanometers in the visible light spectrum are red, wavelengths around 600 are orangey, and 500 green, blue, and then 400 blue, purple, etc., and so on. And this is why wavelength matters. So now the question is what controls which wavelengths will be absorbed by the mineral and which won't. This comes down to the interaction of a light with specific atoms in the crystal structure of the mineral. There are three main types of interactions between light and crystal structure that we'll talk about. These include crystal field transitions, molecular orbital transitions, and color centers. Don't get scared though, we're not going to go too in depth in this introductory video. The first one we'll talk about is crystal field transitions. This is just interactions between the energy of white light, so white light is just all wavelengths of visible light at once, with the d orbitals of certain elements in the crystal structure of that mineral. Transition elements are commonly the color causing elements, and this is why they're called chromophore elements. So when white light interacts with the d orbitals of these transition elements or chromophore elements, it will reflect or transmit different wavelengths of light depending on the transition element that it's interacting with. For example, there are three common varieties of garnet that are very different in color due to different transition or chromophore elements in their crystal structure. For example, almondine has iron in its structure, which is the chromophore element in its structure that causes it to come out as a red color, whereas spessartine has manganese in its structure, which is why it comes off orange, and uveravite has chromite in its structure, which is why it comes off green. The next type of color-causing interaction is the molecular orbital transitions. This is just when electrons are transferred between adjacent cations in the crystal structure. When this happens, for example, in sapphire, electrons can be transferred between iron 2 plus and titanium 4 plus and iron 3 plus and titanium 3 plus respectively, depending on where the electron is at the time. And iron and titanium are actually just trace elements in the structure of sapphire, which control its entire color. For example, if you get rid of those trace elements and just have the pure major composition of the sapphire mineral, it's actually a variety of corundum, which is just aluminum oxide. And the corundum without those trace contaminants in the structure would actually be colorless. And with different trace contaminants in its structure, such as chromium, for example, in ruby, it can come off a whole different color, such as red, as in rubies. The last type of color causing interaction we'll talk about is color centers. Color centers are caused by defects in the crystal structure, such as ionic vacancies, where an ion should be, but it's not there. And those vacancies can become filled with excess electrons to try and balance out the charges that should be there that aren't. For example, fluorite is calcium fluoride, and this may have missing fluoride ions in some places in the crystal structure that causes vacancies to form, and these vacancies can then be filled with electrons that absorb light in a particular way that cause it to come off blue, whereas fluorite without these vacancies comes off as different colors. For example, fluorite is commonly green or purple, and so it depends a lot on these vacancies, and this interaction of light with these electrons and these vacancies is called color centers. The next thing we'll talk about is play of color. This is a really helpful identifier for minerals because not many minerals actually exhibit play of color, which is something such as opalescence. As we see in opal, it kind of shines in a certain way that's particular to opal. And this is due to the interaction of light with the regularly packed array of tiny silica spheres, 3,000 angstroms in diameter, containing different water content and cemented together by amorphous silica. However, the play of color is not only observed in opal, it's also observed in other minerals such
such as labradorite and rose quartz. Labradorite is a plagioclase feldspar mineral that exhibits colors ranging from blue to green to yellow to red, and this play of color in labradorite is known as labradorescence. Additionally, rose quartz can exhibit a six-rayed optical phenomenon known as asterism, which results from light reflected from minute inclusions arranged in a star-like pattern in the quartz. It can also be seen in star rubies and star sapphires. Now moving to mineral luster. The luster of minerals can be broken down into several main categories, including metallic minerals, which have a metallic luster. They come off looking like metals. Adamantine mineral luster, such as seen in diamonds. Glassy mineral luster, which is pretty easy to identify. It just looks glassy. Then we have resinous mineral lusters, which resemble the luster of resin. And then we have pearly mineral lusters, which resemble pearls. Then we have silky mineral lusters, such as shown here in this gypsum. And then obviously we have dull or earthy mineral lusters, which don't really shine in any way that we can classify under the other luster types. These mineral lusters can be good for identifying large, broader groups of mineral but obviously can't be the distinguishing feature of a specific mineral because many minerals fall under each category. So now moving on to mineral streak. For many metallic minerals, the color of the streak of the mineral or the powdered form of the mineral may be different than that of the hand specimen and therefore helpful for identification. For example, there are five minerals shown down at the bottom of the screen that have different streak colors and streaks of minerals are just taken by scraping the mineral along a porcelain plate and then looking at the color that comes off of the mineral. For example, here we have tourmaline with a colorless streak and then hematite with a red streak and then limonite with a yellow brown streak and magnetite with a black streak and hornblende with another colorless streak. And this is just to name a few and so using mineral streak can often help with identifying minerals as well. Next we have cleavage and this is a really important one. Basically cleavage is a property of minerals directly related to the crystal structure structure because it exhibits the way in which minerals break along specific crystallographic planes. And so therefore we can tell a little bit about the internal crystal structure of the mineral by the way it's breaking along these planes. For example, mica minerals such as muscovite shown here has planar cleavage because its crystal structure or its atoms within its crystal structure are ordered in sheets. And so these sheet-like arrays of atoms don't want to break and so they'll break between their sheets. And so this is kind of how we can tell the internal structure by looking at the cleavage of the mineral. Below the muscovite, we have orthoclase and tourmaline, and these are examples of minerals with two planes of cleavage rather than just the one shown in the planar cleavage of muscovite. And minerals with two different planes of cleavage have what's called prismatic cleavage. However, this prismatic cleavage can be broken down into two main types, types in which minerals such as orthoclase break along two planes of cleavage at 90 degrees to one another, and types in which they break along two planes of cleavage that aren't at 90 degrees from each other. Then moving below the tourmaline, we have halite, which is an example of cubic cleavage, aka three cleavage planes at 90 degrees to each other. However, below this, we have another mineral with three planes of cleavage that aren't at 90 degrees from each other, and this is known as rhombohedral cleavage, and this example is calcite. Calcite has three planes of cleavage and is actually really recognizable for its cleavage planes and the way that it refracts light. Next, we have octahedral cleavage shown in the example of these fluorite specimens here and these octahedral minerals are defined by their four planes of cleavage. Then lastly we have dodecahedral minerals such as garnet which has six planes of cleavage. And then I already said lastly but I'm going to go back on my word and move all the way back up here to this top mineral here. This is actually the last one I want to talk about for cleavage. This is a mineral that doesn't break along cleavage planes and actually has what's called conchoidal fracture and this this is because of the lack of arrangement or structure in its atomic crystal structure and therefore it breaks along whatever planes instead of breaking in a predictable pattern. And this is seen typically in things like glass. If you ever watch glass break, it breaks in a conchoidal fracture pattern and it won't break along specific planes because it has an amorphous structure rather than a crystalline structure. Now moving to mineral hardness. Mineral hardness is another really diagnostic feature you can use to identify minerals. So it's very helpful when dealing with hand specimens and there are certain ways that we can test it out and I'll show you that in the next slide. But here let's just talk about the general hardness scale and which minerals fall under which numbers on the Mohs hardness scale. So number one on the Mohs hardness scale
scale or the least hard mineral on the most hardness scale is talc. Then you have gypsum with a hardness of two. Then you have calcite with a hardness of three. You have fluorite with a hardness of four. You have apatite with a hardness of five. Orthoclase with a hardness of six. Quartz with a hardness of seven. Topaz with a hardness of eight. Corundum with a hardness of nine. And diamond as the hardest mineral with a hardness of 10. So great, but what exactly does hardness mean and how can we test it? Well, hardness is defined as the resistance of a smooth surface to the scratching by a sharp point or edge or by another mineral. So ways that we could test this in the lab include things like scratching with our fingernails or other items that have specific hardnesses that we know, and then we can deduce what the hardness of the mineral we're working with is. For example, we have talc, which can be scratched with our fingernails, which have a hardness of around 2.2. And so we know that anything that can be scratched with our fingernails must have a hardness less than 2.2. For example, gypsum can also be scratched with our fingernails, but it's a lot harder to do than for talc. Talc pretty much just falls apart in your hands, so you don't even need to try. Whereas gypsum, you'll have to kind of try and scratch it with your fingernail, and then you can. Whereas calcite and the rest are over 2.2 and therefore can't be scratched with your fingernail. So then you have to find other items. For example, pennies, which have a hardness of around 3.2, can scratch calcite, but obviously they have a hardness less than four and therefore can't be used for the rest of the minerals on this slide. So we move to pocket knives, which have a hardness of 5.1, therefore can scratch fluorite and can scratch appetite if you work really hard at it. But another thing that scratches appetite a little bit better is a glass plate. Glass plates have a hardness of around 5.5 and therefore can be used to scratch appetite. However, after five or after appetite on the hardness scale, you gotta get a little creative with your items because these minerals become really hard to scratch. For example, instead of scratching them, maybe you have to see what they scratch. For example, quartz and topaz will scratch glass, and so you can tell if they are scratching the glass plate you're using to scratch the other minerals, then that's probably quartz or topaz, or corundum and diamond, which actually cut glass. And so you can try to do that with your lab equipment, but another way to do it is just to use the other harder minerals to scratch the previous minerals if you know that you have a harder mineral on hand. And then there's also porcelain plates, which you can use for your streak tests. And you can also use them to scratch the minerals that are less hard than seven because they have a hardness of around seven. Then we have specific gravity. Specific gravity or relative density is the ratio of the weight of a substance compared to that of the weight of the same substance in a different material as a standard. The reference material used for solids and minerals is water. And an example of the calculation of specific gravity, for example, galena, as shown here in this picture, is by taking the ratio of the weight of the galena in air to that of galena in water. And we can see that the specific gravity of galena comes out to around 7.5, which is relatively a really high specific gravity for mineral types, because if we take one that we all know very well, for example, halite, we see that its specific gravity is actually 2.1. And so if you hold a piece of halite that is the same size as a piece of galena, and you hold them in either hand, you'll tell a big difference about which one feels heavier, even though they're the same size. And that one's going to be the galena, whereas halite or salt is comparatively very light. And this is another way you can try and identify hand specimens in the lab is by testing out their specific gravity, especially when you have other known minerals on hand that you can use as a relative test as you're trying to figure out the specific gravity of your mineral. Lastly, we have mineral magnetism, solubility, and radioactivity. These are the last three diagnostic features of minerals we'll talk about today, and these can all be tested with simple lab equipment. For example, magnetite is an iron oxide mineral that exhibits magnetism, and therefore if you have any magnets around in the lab, you can use them to see if the mineral you're working with is magnetite, or if the rock you're working with has magnetite in it. And this can be pretty useful because there's a lot of other metallic minerals that look a little bit like magnetite. For example, if you don't have a good enough crystal to see the crystal habit of it, or any of that, and it's just a blob and it's just part of a rock and you don't really know what it is, it could look like the same color of the previous mineral we are talking about, galena. And it could look like a lot of other minerals that are commonly used in the lab. It's just dark gray. So how are you going to identify that? Well, the magnet is the easiest way to do that for magnetite. Additionally, there are ways to test solubility for certain minerals that react with hydrogen chloride. For example, all geology labs typically have dilute hydrogen chloride on hand. And when a drop of this is placed onto calcite or other calcium carbonate minerals, they typically fizz in a reaction that is sometimes called effervescence. But basically this reaction the mineral has with the acid is indicative
perspective of it being a carbonate mineral and how much it fizzes can sometimes tell you the difference between calcite and dolomite. Calcite will fizz more than dolomite, etc. So you can use that when you're unsure if what you're looking at is calcite or maybe, for example, halite, because sometimes those can look similar. And so acid is a really good way to tell the difference between those. Additionally, we have uraninite, which is a uranium containing mineral that is radioactive. And if you're unsure about identifying this one in a hand specimen in the lab, sometimes there are tools like Geiger counters that can detect the radioactivity of this mineral and aid in its identification. But again, this one's kind of one that you probably won't have to use very often because I doubt many labs will actually make you identify uranium containing minerals. So anyway, with that, that is all I have for you guys today. For the upcoming mineralogy videos, we'll be talking a lot more about crystal structures, crystal systems, Miller indices, crystallographic notations of minerals, optical mineralogy, common igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic minerals respectively, and even a little bit about the analytical techniques that we can use to identify minerals and how they work. So anyway, please go check those out when they're out, or if they're out, go check those out now. And uh, with that, thanks again for watching, and I can't wait to see you guys next time. Bye! States of aggregate, states of mineral aggregate, states of mineral aggregate. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez Louise. And other minerals that also have two planes of two planes of creep. Two planes of creep. Stalactic pick. Stalactic stalactitic, right?